Okay, my name is Avishai Silvershatz. I run a venture capital fund in Israel. To, to the amazement of most of us, the new Minister of Education surprised us by showing deep uh, passion towards his uh, new ministerial role. And one of the interesting observations he made, non-trivial one, was the distinction between the role of a teacher as a subject matter expert and the role of a teacher as a person, as a coach, as a person giving motivation, which is, even not for a non-political non person, this is non-trivial observation. <laughs> and it seems to be the key for a lot of what we see in the change resistance of this sector towards any change at all. The, the, the question, what is the role of a teacher where he is no longer the subject matter expert and he is losing his traditional authority? The question is, can you, what, it will be, what should we expect 10 years from now with this respect? What is, will be the role of a teacher in a classroom where he is no longer the subject matter expert in many of the d domains he is really leading? So, so I'll, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I do think that it is the design of learning environments that is the essential competence of teachers. That, that, if you think about it, that means recognizing the needs of the learner, right? That's a big problem that a teacher has to do. Recognize the needs of the learner, recognize the resources and tools that can help the learner, support the learner's growth in unexpected and unanticipated ways, that is, to provide autonomy and freedom. Um, and then I think the teacher's role is also to assess the quality of the learning experience. One of the great tragedies, I think, of American US education is that we have ceded responsibility for assessment to commercial testing companies. I would invite you to beware of this vicious pernicious problem. A teacher is responsible for creating a learning environment and that makes, that puts the learner at the center. Um, I think that teachers crave authority, I know I do, but I get my authority from being able to recognize my learner's needs, provide them with the resources and tools they need to, to, to demonstrate the learning that really matters, and then assess the quality of that. And I love when students exceed my expectations. So I think those are the essential components. In my experience, it's a bit of a false dichotomy that you either have to coach or teach. And I think technology, when you can open up teachers' eyes, they can open up to the opportunity to really teach. And I'll give you uh, two examples, because just giving a lecture isn't really teaching. Two quick examples. We're studying an online homework tool in mathematics. It's not that exciting a tool, actually. But every morning, the teacher gets a report of what the kids did on their homework last night. And the change it makes possible is this. Beforehand, the teacher would walk into the classroom and say to the students, what did you have trouble with last night? Let's talk about it. And the kids would sit there. Now the teacher says, I see everyone was really having different answers on number four. Let's look at some of your different answers and discuss them. That's an opportunity to teach you didn't have before because you know more about your students. The second thing we see is sometimes is you have technologies that can be incredibly engaging, keep kids working very hard, and now the teacher has time to work with the individual student and know something about what they were struggling with just a minute ago and walk in and really teach. So I don't, th I don't think it's necessary to go between coaching and teaching. I think it's to go between what you thought was teaching and really teaching. So I, I, let, let me just give a, a, a quick story. Um, I, I'll do it, I answer the question by example. We'll take one of these teachers that Renee referred to as sort of two or three standard deviations away from the norm that she doesn't worry about because they're already doing it. So I'll tell you about a teacher, Rosamel, a friend of mine in, in Uruguay from a little farming village about two hours north of Montevideo. And she's a great instructor and teacher. Uh, Monday morning, whole week organized, she knew what she was gonna do. And one of the students walks into the room with a loofah, the little natural sponge, and says to, to the teacher, says to Rosamel, teacher, teacher, what is this? 
So Rosamel threw the week out the window, seized the opportunity. The first day, Monday, the children figured out what it was. They used technology, they used the tools to figure out what it was. The second day, Tuesday, they figured out whether or not they could grow it in their community. On Wednesday, they figured out whether or not they should grow it in their community. On Thursday, they put together their presentation so that on Friday they could convince their farmer parents they should grow this new cash crop for their community. So it, it's seizing the opportunity. You know, the teacher is, is, is a special person who can see that, see that opportunity to shape the learning using the technology as a tool. It's a tool. It's not a curriculum. And, and, and making these experiences happen. It will happen, but as we discussed at the break, it's gonna take a while, and I think the kids are gonna drive that change. Hello, um, I'm Philippe. I'm an interdisciplinary researcher. I would like to, to get back a question that actually came out of the moderation of the industry, and I would like to understand the educator's perspective. And um, it's about ethics of privacy and the, the awareness of civil society or the lack of awareness of civil society. What is an opt-in and what uh, the opt-in, like when you give up your information that's being used for surveillance, for government control, for making money, for making more efficient things. And of course, there's lots of possibilities in education. And uh, they discuss a little bit about like uh, being concerned about the data of the kids. But how about the formation of this awareness, of this consciousness, of this, uh, let's say, terrible things that are happening right now? It's some kind of lack of ethics uh, towards not engaging civil society in this discussion and only focusing on industry, legal departments of industry, tech people, maybe some lobby, maybe some government. And how uh, do you see this as formation kids, this awareness and taking part in this discussion and understand this big problem that is happening right now and we are not aware. You get, Walter likes to have the last word, so I'll go first. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, we, we, we like to frame up the uh, idea of digital and media literacy around the yin and yang of empowerment and protection. We think that media tools and technologies and texts are powerful and empowering, but we also think they have, some, they have a dark side, right? And that it's absolutely just as important to talk about the dangers and risks and potential harms of digital media as it is to talk about the affordances. That being said, what happens when you become a creator, when teachers become a creator, is that some of their misconceptions start to evaporate. We measured in the 100, 120 people came to our Summer Institute in Digital Literacy last summer. We measured their attitudes at the beginning of the week and at the end of the week and now, you know, nine months later. Turns out when they start the week, they think the major challenges to integrating technology in education in elementary and secondary is cost and the biggest problem is privacy. By the end of the week, they don't think those things are very important anymore. Why? Because they've discovered that they can do all kinds of things with free and low cost tools, that they don't need to buy a whole lot of new things. And they've discovered that the dynamic of privacy is while we want to be sensitive to the risks and the opportunities, teachers discover during the weeks that the opportunities outweigh the risks. Right? And so that encourages them. Now, many are still not comfortable putting up samples of student work online. So I can't share with you some of the examples of student work online because my teachers still aren't that comfortable sharing student work online. That's part of a community process. We have to engage parents and the community to appreciate the pride that a child feels when his algebra solution that he does on a little you know, screencast is presented as a model example of how to solve a quadratic equation. The pride that that child feels is so extraordinary. We want that to be on YouTube, right? But right now, that's part of a community conversation. We have to involve parents and policymakers around how student work and how student data should be, when it, when it should be shared and when it shouldn't be shared. 
Yeah, I just want to say this is an enormous issue. Uh, as a researcher, I used to spend almost 0% of my time worrying about data and privacy. And now to get my research done, it's a huge percentage of our time because it's such a hot issue in society. And I think one example that's telling about that, Bill Gates, has, through his foundation, funded a company in Bloom. It's a famous example. And data privacy brought the company to its knees and collapsed it. So you can have all the power and all the money in the world and these issues of education, data privacy, can bring you to your knees in a week. And it's a big challenge for a field, big, big challenge. You know, I, I'm somewhat of a Luddite in, in, in regard to this. I, I really don't think that we should be putting the kids in these situations at all. I, I don't think that there's any reason why the kids have to ever share data. Uh, I think that you can design the technology such that things stay in the classroom or things stay within a small group and don't ever have to leave. I think that if you're going to, I mean, there's certainly, you know, feedback, reflection is really important to the learner. You can do that without making it leave the classroom, without making it be public in any, any fashion or risk being public in any fashion. I, I think we should just make that be the way we do things. Wow. You've got to be kidding me. No. <laughs> that seems crazy. So remember the point of school? The point of school is to prepare students for life. The idea is that the communication and expression, the knowledge and skills we gain, that they have meaning in the world outside the classroom. If children never get to experience the power of communication to make a difference in the world, guess how they'll grow up? They'll grow up thinking, they can't make a difference in the world. I, I think the children are already out in the world doing things. I'm talking about what we make them do in school, okay? What we have them do in school. I think that, I, I think that there's no reason why we need to be connecting to all this stuff and doing, I think that we can have simple tools that they own, that they build, that they control within the classroom, within after school, and, and they can make those decisions. But I, I think that it, we're building these dependencies right now that are, are completely unnecessary. We're, we're connecting them to, to services that are completely unnecessary. And, and I, I think that that's wrong. Okay, so then I have another, 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 another fight to pick with you in true Israeli tradition, right? I, I, will, I will pick a fight with you on, on one topic, which is a very dangerous idea that I think you promoted. And I want to reflect on why I think this idea is dangerous. So you said, as have many, many um, well-respected philanthropies and funders and venture capitalists in the United States, we don't need to change schools. We'll just promote a parallel learning, out of school learning. We'll fund out of school learning and we'll let schools wither and die. When did I ever say that? You said, we don't have to do this in school, we can guys, do this guys, out of school. Behave. There are Israelis here. I, I, think it's very <laughs> I think it's very dangerous to position digital learning as something that has to happen out of school oh, no, no, because no, no, schools no. can't uh, accommodate Renee, you're, you're, you're putting words in my mouth, okay? I, I, think that, that, you know, I, I think that we absolutely want kids to be doing digital learning, but maybe we have a different definition of what digital learning is. I think digital learning is being empowered by the tools, making things, programming, and I don't think that you, you need to rely on some web service to do that. I think you can do that in the classroom. I think you can do that in the privacy of the classroom and the privacy of, of, of the child's life without going out there using all that stuff. I think it's, it's not complicated. It's actually quite simple. The tools all run autonomously, but that's not the way the market works because that's not how the mar market makes money. But I think we can fight against that and, and actually have the kids engaging with this stuff in the classroom with the, the help and supervision and coaching and, and mentorship and, and instruction of the teacher. But I think it, it doesn't have to be done utilizing all that connectivity. Jeremy, I have a very important addition to make. Just, just We've put food. the food on the table. Let's eat lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much.